are filtering in, but we can go ahead and get started with our League of Women Voters Dane County Forum on transportation, kicking climate to the curb. I'm sorry, kicking carbon to the curb. <laughs> uh, my name is Carol Barford, and I am a member of the Climate Crisis Subcommittee of the League of Women Voters. And uh, we are so very glad to welcome all of you and especially our panelists here tonight while we talk about greenhouse gas emissions and transportation. Um, the basic outline is that I'm going to give a little bit of context setting uh, for the forum, and then we will have our three panelists give their remarks. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about League of Women Voters activities related to um, transportation and climate change, and then we're going to have Q&A for the rest of the hour. So first of all, why? is the Climate Crisis Subcommittee preparing a forum on transportation. Well, probably most of you are well aware that uh, transportation emits greenhouse gases and we need to do our best to curb the emission of greenhouse gases to avoid the worst effects of climate change. Um, this panel in this slide here, the left-hand panel, shows different scenarios of possible, possible course of greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions in over the, the rest of, uh, of the 21st century. Uh, the um, dark lines are the, are the greenhouse gas emissions and the shaded areas show the uh, um, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere that would uh, result from those emissions. So the blue is where we want to be. That is where we would achieve by the end of the 21st century, uh, a temperature increase of less than two degrees Celsius. And that is shown on the right-hand panel. Uh, you can see the the little blue circles that are color coded the same way as the left panel, where it says 430 to 480, that is a, a greenhouse that is a greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere that would keep us below a two degrees C change, the kind of change that would cause uh, loss of coastline, um, agricultural production um, deficits, and um, all kinds of situations that we're trying to avoid. So. Transportation is, uh, in the US especially, the largest uh, sector of greenhouse gas emissions. The, the transportation sector emits more greenhouse gases than anything else, between a quarter and a third. Um, if you look at the right-hand uh, pie chart, that is showing the contribution of transportation in the global greenhouse gas emissions. And it's it's not colored the same. Transportation is shown there in the sort of brick red uh, at 14%. So this is just to show that Americans, uh, as a fraction of total greenhouse gas emissions, transportation is a big one for us. But uh, how does that break down? Uh, transportation sector is really complicated, including all kinds of shipping, modes of shipping, air travel, et cetera. Um, in 2019, uh, light duty vehicles, that is cars, minivans, SUVs, uh, account for 58% of the greenhouse gas emissions of the transportation sector. So those are the, the cars and the, and the trucks that you and I drive. Um, also shown on this slide is just thinking of a, of a person and, and a person's greenhouse gas uh, footprint. Uh, as it works out, transportation is about 28% of, of that footprint as well. So this is not really accounting for uh, industry and commercial activities. This is just a, the greenhouse gas footprint of a person. 28% uh, is transportation. And the other pie chart uh, shows that this is, for the average American, this is really overwhelmingly their personal vehicle. So at, at the rate that most Americans travel by plane or boat, uh, that is not contributing nearly as much as the vehicles that we drive every day. So given the fact 
that uh, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by the end of this decade and nearly to zero by 2050 to avoid the worst uh, outcomes of climate change, we really need to look hard at transportation. So we're gonna talk later in the forum about some things that we can all do uh, to reduce our vehicle miles traveled and the emissions from that. But first, we are going to hear from our panelists. And I am gonna introduce the first panelist, which is uh, Philip Gritzmacher Jr. Philip is a transportation planner working in the city of Madison's Department of Transportation. He's currently working on a variety of transportation projects, including the transportation demand management, which aims to reduce vehicle miles traveled in the Madison area. Prior to working in the city of Madison, he served as city planner in Sun Prairie and as a transportation planner for the Greater Madison Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO. We're gonna be hearing a lot about MPO, I think, uh, tonight. So uh, welcome, Philip. Thank you, and, and thanks for having me. I'm gonna share my screen. I have a brief presentation, and I wanna talk a little bit about what transportation demand management is, because it, it really does aim to, 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 to satisfy a lot of what you were talking about, reducing single occupant vehicle trips. Uh, so you've already introduced what this is. It is a package of policies and strategies uh, with the aim of reducing a single occupant vehicle trips and uh, vehicular miles traveled generally. This is important because if we take a look at what's been going on uh, in, in the US, you'll see that over, since 1970, we've had a 190% increase in, in vehicular miles traveled. Uh, but our population has only gone up 60%. And that's a reflection of the transportation investments that we've made since then. Uh, we've done things like this, expanded roadways as far as we can, but we're out of space. So we need to do something else. And this is also really bad for anyone who wants to bike or walk or take a bus. It's not safe. So we need to look at another way of, 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 of doing things. Uh, so we've already talked about greenhouse gas emissions, that's a huge reason why we want to do this. Uh, but it's not just warming, it's also flooding. So one of the things I wanted to point out here is if you see this little arrow right here, this is where we are and we're seeing it on average four extra in inches of precipitation per year. And that's not coming evenly. In fact, some cases, it's like 2018, where we see massive flooding throughout the city because our infrastructure can't handle it. And as was mentioned, our biggest uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in this country is transportation. So a lot of that comes down to what we're doing with our physical infrastructure and what we're doing to facilitate growth. So traditionally, when we have a new development, we will look at our transportation network and expand that network to facilitate the new trips that that development would, uh, would create. And with TDM, we try to right size the trips that are coming from that development to the transportation network that we have by shifting people to other modes of transportation and not just giving them the option to take a car uh, as, as they please. That's really in alignment with our city plans, uh, both our comprehensive plan and our transportation plan, the mayor's sustainability vision, uh, which she released earlier this year, and a number of regulations that we have in the city that reference TDM. So this is something that we've been doing for 20 or so years, but the application has been uneven. It's been kind of complicated for not just uh, developers to navigate, but also our elected officials, uh, which means that in some cases we could be pushing development out of the city into places that don't have TDM, meaning that we get all of the negatives of uh, the, the, the vehicle trips and none of the, the ability to, to push those trips to other modes of transportation. So an example of this is Madison Yards, which is at, at, at uh, at uh, uh, Hill Farms, it took seven meetings to get through the TDM process. One of those meetings was over an hour trying to figure out if uh, the TDM uh, mitigation measures that they, they were providing were good enough. So we're gonna try to do, well, and uh, it appears that my uh, slide is broken, so I apologize. Uh, basically, we, we currently have uh, two thirds of our trips uh, in the Madison area are in single occupant vehicles. So that's good for our city of our size, but there's always an opportunity to, to do better. 
and with a with a new TDM program, we're hoping that we can uh, mitigate those those uh, those vehicular miles that are being traveled, uh, increase access to alternative transportation, reduce congestion, travel delay, noise, and and uh, support denser infill development, which will ultimately lead to a safer transportation network. And we have a whole process set up for this where you would figure out if it's applicable to you uh, based on uh, the size of your development, land use characteristics, the parking you're providing and, and where your development's occurring. Uh, you would go through this process, uh, determine what measures you'd want to take, create a plan and then report out to us uh, that, that plan. And you do that annually. So we've come up with a number of measures um, and we've gone through an iterative process. There's about 43 measures now uh, that, that the developer could choose from that have different point values based on their effectiveness and costs and uh, you know, uh, other contextual features such as the location of the development. And we have modifiers in there that will provide points for proximity to certain types of alternative transportation. And we're taking a look and we're, we're trying to, to ensure that when we, are, uh, when we are applying our TDM program, we're not pushing development out of the city. So we're, we have modifiers based on the location of the development as well to ensure that uh, if something is on the periphery, for instance, where we're, we're, we would require 65% of the, of the TDM points, uh, we're able to capture that development in Madison and not push it out to Verona or Middleton or Sun Prairie or Fitchburg, because that was a concern early on in the process. We also provide points for proximity to transit hoping to well, have that development focus in areas that have good access to transit. So we're doing a number of things to try to make sure that the, the plan is as effective as possible. We've also created a tool to try to make it easy to participate in the plan to encourage developers to participate in this process. And uh, the, whole, the aim would be to make it very, very straightforward so that as they propose their project, they input the characteristics of the project uh, and then are able to select from a menu of options for mitigation measures, some of which are infrastructure based and some of which are programmatic. And uh, hopefully this makes it very straightforward for anyone that's engaging in the process. And, and again, doesn't force uh, development just outside of the city limits. So we can actually reduce the vehicle miles traveled within the city. So we've got some loose ends that we wanna, we wanna figure out. We know that single family uh, neighborhoods drive a lot of that VMT. That's something that many TDM plans don't really uh, cover. And we're, we're, so we're looking for ways to, to handle that, either through the planning process when neighborhoods are developed or through the TDM process. Um, once we have that figured out, we, we refine and tinker with our measures. We're gonna take this, the, 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 the next, which hopefully will be the final draft of the program to our, our policy boards, um, take it out for one last round of public comment and then hopefully get this adopted as an ordinance this winter. That's what I have on TDM. So thank you for the opportunity to present. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'll just remind the uh, the audience that um, we'll be taking questions later. So um, you, I'm I'm assuming though that you can enter them into the Q and A at any time. So um, so go ahead and and let those juices uh, flow. So our next speaker is Robbie Weber. Uh, Robbie is uh, recently uh, an honorary fellow with the State Smart Transportation Initiative, a joint project of the UW-Madison and Smart Growth America. She served as an alder on the Madison Common Council and on the Madison Area MPO, the federally designated Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Madison area. She has been a program manager at the Bike Bicycle Federation of Wisconsin for nine years. Outside of work, she serves on the board of directors of Madison Bikes. And since 1998, she's taught bicycle skills and safety to individuals and community groups. So welcome, Robbie. Thank you. So um, I do wanna emphasize that I am not working at SSTI now. So anything that I say is not representing them. And my time at the Bike Fed was uh, from 1998 eight to 2007. So I'm not working for them either. Um, I was on the board of directors for Madison for the bike fed, which is the statewide um, bicycle organization. And now I'm on the board of directors for Madison bikes, which is the local bike organization. 
So when I worked at the university at SSTI, we spent a lot of time working with state and local DOTs to think about forward innovative practices that could deal with 21st century issues with 21st century solutions instead of 20th century solutions. And one of the last things I worked on before uh, leaving, uh, retiring in uh, July of last year was a report very similar to what Philip just presented, but we were doing, we were working mostly with the city of Los Angeles who has uh, embraced their TDM program as well. Um, so a lot of what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna use the term transportation system. And I wanna emphasize that different modes of transportation work together and can be used for different trips you know, the right tool for the right job. Um, people sometimes, when I try and encourage people to use other modes of transportation, they'll often say, well, I can't bike to work because, or I can't take the bus to work because. And I say, well, you know, you can combine two modes of transportation. You could drive partway in from Mount Horeb and then get on the bus and not have to pay for parking for downtown. Um, or maybe you can leave your bike somewhere and bike the last bit to campus so that you don't have to pay for a parking space on campus. Um, <clears throat> I think sometimes people get into a rut. They use the same mode of transportation all the time. Uh, often that is driving and they don't think about what their options are for different trips. But most trips in the United States are less than five miles and a good portion of them are less than two miles. So what about some of those trips? Going to dinner with your friends, uh, taking your kids to school or biking with your kids to school, uh, picking up some milk at the grocery store if that's all you need, um, going to the library to pick up a book. Some of these trips can be made by walking, by biking, maybe taking the bus downtown, um, then you can have that extra cocktail and you don't have to worry about driving home. Um, <clears throat> but different modes of transportation are right for different trips that you make. And I think sometimes when we think about cutting our driving, we concentrate on the trip to work. A lot of, a lot of TDM, I don't think the city of Madison is doing this, but a lot of TDM programs are very focused on getting people to change how they get to work, which is great but that's only 20% of the trips that we make. They tend to be the longest. They tend to be the ones that we kind of build our lives around. You know, we're gonna use this method of transportation. So then we have to do everything before and after work with that method of transportation as well. But there are all these other types of trips that we can also think about. And sometimes it's as simple as uh, when you go shopping, not driving between the stores, but walking between the stores instead the park once policy. Um, so I hope that we can be a little bit more deliberate about making some decisions about using the right mode of transportation for each trip that we make instead of relying on the same ones all the time. And that is usually, again, driving. Um, I do, do also want to mention electric cars because they're great for cutting emissions, but there are still some um, issues with them. First of all, unless you're purchasing 100% renewable energy. A lot of our energy in a lot of our electricity in, the, in Wisconsin still comes from very dirty sources. So we're still dealing with emissions there. And then of course, car, electric cars still use the same infrastructure as any other you know, diesel or, or gasoline cars. And as Philip mentioned, flooding is something we have to think about and hard surfaces like roads and parking lots are real contributors to flooding in a lot of areas. So we wanna think about the infrastructure that we're paying for, for any kind of car, even if it ran on water. Um, so <laughs> the other thing that I wanna mention that maybe Zia and Philip can't, can't um, push as much is that we as citizens need to 
tell our elected officials and our city staff and local staff and county and whoever that we want communities where walking, biking, and transit is not just possible, but easy and comfortable and safe and that it's encouraged. A lot of policies, a lot of the ways that we build our communities make it almost impossible to do anything except drive. If you've got a giant road between you and the library, it's really scary to walk or bike across that. So of course you're gonna drive. So we need to build our communities so that it's possible to walk, bike and take transit and choose those for other trips. When things are closer together, you don't drive as much. When there aren't so many huge roads, you don't drive as much. When there's sidewalks and good transit and bike lanes and bike paths, those choices become a lot easier. And then the final thing is that parking policy can really make a difference as well. Um, there have been studies that show that if someone has free parking at when they come home or at their destination, they're much more likely to drive. One of the reasons that a lot of people don't drive into downtown or to the campus is that it's harder to find parking and you have to pay a lot for it. So the way, the way we give parking to people really makes a big difference on how much people drive. And I'm gonna leave it there and uh, we'll get into a lot of these topics um, in the Q and A. All right, yes, we will. Thank you very much, Robbie. Um, our third speaker is Zia Brukaya, Program Manager for Round Trip, the Transportation Demand Management Program of the Greater Madison Metropolitan Planning Organization that promotes sustainable transportation options in Dane County. Zia's work focuses on developing partnerships to support TDM in the Madison region and connecting individuals and employers with smart alternatives to driving alone. Prior to joining the MPO, Zia worked as a senior planner at Urban Assets, where she led public engagement for planning projects in the Madison area, including the East-West BRT planning study and major roadway reconstructions. She also served as the Indiana Complete Streets Coalition Coordinator from 2013 to 2014. So take it away, Zia. Thanks, Carol. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have a few slides. And uh, I'll be, Robbie and uh, Philip did a great job of staying on time. So I will work to do the same. Um, and I will be uh, connecting with a lot of the, the kind of themes and, and uh, messages that, that Robbie and Philip have already discussed. So um, I will mainly, I'll share a little bit of information about the Greater Madison MPO and then the round trip TDM program, and then talk through um, kind of the nuts and bolts of some of the transportation options that we have here in uh, Dane County. So the Greater Madison MPO, you've heard that mentioned already, um, we're the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Madison region. Uh, so we mostly cover Dane County, everything that you see here on the screen. Uh, MPOs are required in urbanized areas of 50,000 or more in population um, in order to be able to spend uh, federal highway and transit funding on local projects. Um, so the MPO is responsible for creating a cooperative um, regional transportation plan and um, coordinating that planning and decision making about how transportation investments are made um, and how those federal dollars are spent. Uh, we're governed by a 14 member policy board that you see here on the left uh, with representatives from all of, the, of these different entities, including city of Madison, um, towns, suburban communities, the county, the state and uh, Metro Transit. And then the round trip program is a program of the MPO um, focused on transportation demand management. It was created to really focus on reducing vehicle miles traveled or VMT um, and congestion in the region. And so through this program, we encourage and support and promote all of these different transportation options. 
um, walking, biking, carpooling, van pooling, um, telecommuting, uh, obvious public transit. And then um, part, uh, you, you might notice parking cash out there, Robbie kind of alluded to that, you know, parking solutions, basically any sort of solutions that can get people out of their personal vehicle and doing something else um, for any kind of trip. Although um, we are primarily focused on supporting commuters at this point, um, but looking to how we can expand this program to support, you know, all different kinds of trips. Um, with all different kinds of modes um, moving forward. So um, right now, Round Trip really focuses on information encouragement and incentives and partnerships. And you may have heard of us in the past as Rideshare, et cetera. Um, we recently rebranded to Round Trip. So why TDM, Philip talked about this quite a bit, so I'll just kind of scoot over this, but essentially TDM is really, really critical to our region as we grow, if we don't want to continue expanding our roadways, expanding our parking lots, um, and you know, kind of dealing with all the negative externalities of that um, for the environment, for the for economic development, for social equity, um, the uh, TDM is really important. Um, so we're just focusing on reducing that. One of the big things is focusing on reducing that mode of transportation to work that you see there on the top right. Um, you know, getting that SOV mode shared down. And I actually just threw in this slide um, as Philip was talking because I thought it might be interesting for you guys to see. Carol mentioned, you know, she said that um, personal choices matter, right? And one of the things that we saw during COVID-19 is the impact um, that can really be had when we take a, a huge amount of cars off the roadway. Um, and in many cases, you know, for people who were able to continue teleworking, um, still contributing to the economy, but not doing so having to get on the road and drive to work every day. Um, in Dane County, we saw that our average daily traffic dropped 40 to 60% of what had been normal um, during the height of the safer at home orders. Uh, over 2020, we did see that come back. Um, to about 70 to 90 percent of normal. And then in September 2020, um, we were looking at, at a total vehicle miles traveled in our county, um, climbing back to just under 5 percent of normal. However, one of the things that really stood out was that peak traffic volumes remained lower. So that's indicating that people were taking um, fewer or, or fewer commute trips, but then more trips to school and work and or school and um, entertainment and for other things like that. So um, even though the, the 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 VMT climbed back and we always love to see it lower, um, you know, five percent reduction does represent something significant when you think about greenhouse gas emissions um, and the peak traffic volumes um, reducing also represents opportunities. You know, our roadways are kind of overbuilt for those peak periods. So if we're no longer having those, what could that mean for creating space for other modes of traffic um, and prioritizing other investments? So at Round Trip, primarily what we do, we focus on assisting individuals, employers, and government entities in Dane County. We have this online ride matching service that you see on the right. Um, we offer, we administer an emergency ride home program for sustainable commuters in Dane County. I'll talk a little bit more about both of those. And then we coordinate with all of the partners that you see here and more um, to promote transportation options through marketing and education in Dane County. And so some of the resources that we have available to us, and this will be kind of setting the stage for, I think, uh, a transportation challenge that Carol and others will be talking about. Um, Round Trip is a platform, it's available for free. The MPO and the State Department of Transportation um, fund this platform. It, you can go on it, create a profile and search for matches for to car, other carpoolers, state van pools, um, bike buddies, metro transit routes and park and rides. So as Robbie said, you know, maybe depending on where you live, maybe your best option is to park at a park and ride and then grab a, a metro route or meet another carpooler um, and come the rest of the way to work that way. Um, the emergency ride home program is available for sustainable commuters. So if you're currently doing that, um, you can sign up and you're eligible for up to six uh, taxi rides home per year for use um, in emergency situations. 
And um, what you're seeing here is basically what a search would look like on the website and, and a list of results in the bottom right of, you know, you get a list of, of folks that you can reach out to and um, make a plan with. Metro Transit, we have an excellent um, metro system here in Madison. All buses are accessible. All buses have bike racks. Um, many different types of cards available. There's a commute card program for businesses that has about 120 businesses um, signed up and uh, providing commute cards to their employees. So that's something that we really promote with employers. Um, Google Maps is a really easy way for you to just you know, type in where you want to go. And if you're on a transit route, it will bring up the route that you should take and when it's coming. And then we have uh, Madison B Cycle, tons of bike resources um, in, in Madison. Madison B Cycle, 100% electric. That system is growing. They just put their first two um, stations in Monona this year, and I think we'll continue to see more suburban location um, locations for B Cycle. Uh, really great options for passes, easy to use. Um, and then I'll just kind of end here in the what you can do, you know, as we start to think about what we can do for any type of trip, commuting to school, um, to entertainment, just give it a shot, try something, identify one trip you can do um, using a, a sustainable mode, make it fun with friends. Um, I definitely encourage you to participate in the League of um, Women Voters Challenge. And then consider talking to your employer about um, how they can help you and, and others where you work um, support sustainable commutes. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Zia. I think I hope we'll round back to some of those uh, details later to flesh them out for, for everybody. Lots of practical stuff. Um, so, uh, thank you very much, all panelists. Uh, that was the most on time, <laughs> on time panelists I've ever hosted. So close to the, to the seven minutes. Thank you very much. Um, so while everybody in the audience is sort of, uh, digesting all that, we have a couple of polls, a couple of activities for everybody. So, um, Many thanks to Julia Gilden, who is running the webinar today, and she is uh, bringing up these polls. So everybody, which of these transportation options do you use regularly? This is multiple choice. So go ahead and, and click. Yeah. Panelists can't do it. <laughs> oh, too bad. All right, so I noticed that personal car is not on here. So this is of basically your, your alternative choices. What are you doing? Looks like the, the, uh, the most favorite is walking. All right, followed by personal bike. And Madison is, of course, one of the most bike friendly cities in the US, often often ranked as the most uh, from year to year. So yay, Madison. All right, I think that's uh, holding steady there pretty much. All right, so that's good. 77% of us walk regularly. All right, so I'm gonna take that poll down or maybe Julia, does it? I'm not sure. And we're going to go to this next poll, please. All right. Which of these transportation options have you tried ever? Go for it. All right, looks 
Still more folks. Good that well over half of us have been on the Metro bus. And five of us have done Zipcar. Two have braved the electric scooter. And some other responses in there. Okay, so good. So the majority of us have been on the bus. That's great. All right. So um, I guess, Julia, you can take that down at your leisure. But right now, I am going to describe initiative of League of Women Voters called Transportation Options Challenge, Kicking Carbon to the Curb, Ordinary People Doing Ordinary Things. So having heard these presentations and learning about some of the many opportunities that exist here in Dane County to help meet our climate commitments, it's your turn to see if you can change your own personal travel habits. In effect, we're asking you to change the longtime metaphor about driving and putting the rubber off the road by walking or biking more, taking a bus or trying a shared cab ride, whatever works for you. All we ask is for you to share experiences about what works for you and what doesn't, what needs to change and what improvements can really matter. This is citizen science at its best. The challenge is simple. All you have to do is fill out a very short survey in November to record the age and mileage of your vehicles and another one in late March to update and document the mileage of your vehicles at that time. That is all. In return, you'll get a custom reusable shopping bag, some free bus passes and a handy monthly chart to record your alternative transportation choices and personal experiences and a series of hints about how to reduce your car's carbon footprint even further. There will be no individual winners to this challenge. The best prize is that ordinary people will be doing ordinary things to help create an extraordinary energy and environmental future. So please join us by clicking on the challenge button on the League of Women Voters Dane County website. And I believe that we will have that link in the chat um, and we hope to see you there. So having announced the challenge, um, which all of us on the Climate Crisis Committee are going to participate in, uh, I am gonna open uh, the forum up to question and answer. So we do have a few already. Can I, can I just um, suggest that if people wanna ask questions, they use the Q&A and not the chat because that way it'll make it easier for the moderators to look in one place. So that's right. your questions in the Q and A, don't use the chat. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to Q and A first, that's right. So if you're serious, you should retype your question into the Q and A. <laughs> All right, so, so an attendee asks, <laughs> uh, says there is some data about transportation related to caregiving, which is borne mostly by women. Women are more likely to trip chain and make more trips, but shorter ones. Are any of the panelists working on TDM that focuses on transportation needs of women? Well, I don't know if I, you can say I have worked on it, but um, I certainly looked at it when I was working at the university. And certainly we know that is an issue. Um, we looked at some cities that actually not even in the United States, that are trying to make their transit more female friendly, making it easier to use strollers, um, safety issues, um, all kinds of things to make transit more welcoming for women and for families because that is certainly an issue. Um, I do know that as part of Madison Bikes, we encourage people to post both their, their photos and their stories about using their bikes for trips that other people think you can't do by bike. Um, going to school, taking more than two kids, doing shopping, um, that sort of thing. And uh, there are a lot of options for different types of bikes where you can use a cargo bike or a bike that can handle two kids sitting behind you or trailers and things like that. And I will say that I think that the BRT system is going to be a real boon to 
people with wheels, shall we say, because it's going to be level boarding, which means strollers, carts, luggage with wheels, wheelchairs, um, and even bicycles are going to be a lot easier to load and unload on the BRT car um, buses than regular buses because there's going to be more space for wheeled vehicles and there's going to be level boarding. And I think that's huge. All right. Uh, add on a little bit to what Robbie said. So as part of the TDM program, we have thought about a couple of things. Uh, and this was actually mentioned at one of the, one of the public engagement meetings that we had. Uh, we're providing points for uh, having daycare, for instance, uh, within buildings, uh, so that if there's a development coming, like a, a larger you know, mixed use development, having a daycare would potentially reduce one of those trips. And then it's really making sure that there are many different uh, alternatives to getting around. So that uh, you know, if, if, a, if a building's going in in, a, in an area that has close proximity to bike share, uh, maybe you can't take all of your trips using the bike share or using your bike or by transit, but you can you can mix the different types of trips that you have. Uh, so that's that's really I think that's really critical providing those options, giving giving women and, and people generally the ability to get around uh, using a variety of modes. Uh, but, but daycare that's something that we've identified as is really important. You know, I'm a, I'm a parent too. And I know that that is a, that completely disrupts the trip. Uh, I take my daughters in and that just completely throws you off. So that is, that is certain, that's certainly a concern. Yeah, that, that is a huge piece as Philip said, the land uses and proximity of uses is really going to be the best tool um, available for helping people, you know, use different modes. Um, I, one thing that I'll mention is that we, through the TDM program, sponsor an annual uh, Love to Ride Bicycle Challenge um, for the region, and that's workplace-based. And one of the reasons that we decided to work with Love to Ride um, and that we really like this challenge model is because um, they've shown through their data that more women um, Part, part, women participate at higher rates in a challenge like that. And it's often a first kind of uh, introduction to bicycling or bicycling to work or bicycling longer distances. And so in terms of just kind of making options feel more accessible and comfortable, um, you know, for people of all genders, I think that's one of the things that we, we think about a lot too. All right, thank you very much. Everybody chimed in on that one. Um, I notice that uh, in the chat, there are a few participants who are asking about, you know, this sounds a lot like Madison. How, how does this look different for people who live uh, in the rural areas? I mean, how, if it's day, uh, I guess it's Madison Metropolitan Planning Organization. How, how much are, are you considering uh, people in rural areas? So I'll, I'll, I'm gonna jump in again too. Um, rural is tough because it's pretty hard to get from your home to anywhere else without a car. I mean, you can do it maybe by bike, maybe you can walk, but it's a long way and often on a highway. But very few people live in rural, really rural areas. Most people live in smaller communities that have, say, a town center, maybe a school, a church, a library, that kind of thing. And again, that's where I talk, was talking about making some of those shorter trips. You know, if you drive from your house into uh, Verona or Mount Horeb or Sun Prairie or Wanakee, can you then park once and do all the other things that you need to do without getting back in your car. And a lot of that has to do with how we build our communities and whether it's easy to do all those things with other modes of transportation. And, and again, a lot of people actually live in those communities. They don't live in rural towns. They live in a smaller cottage grove or, you know, Stoughton or wherever. And can you make those trips by walking, biking, um, getting a ride from somebody or parking once and then walking around to do your errands? I think that's one way to approach it. All right, 
Thank, thank you, Robbie. I think I better get back on to the to the Q and A uh, questions. Um, so Holly McAtee asks uh, to hear about the impact of gig work on uh, on vehicle trips and also on uh, Uber and Lyft and uh, personal shoppers, DoorDash, Grubhub, all of these little vehicle trips. Can, uh, can you see this in your planning, Philip and, and Zia? How, what is this, uh, what's the impact of this? I can jump on that one first. Uh, it, it's certainly something that we thought about with the TDM program. Uh, we initially had measures that would uh, give mitigation points to developers who provided uh, trips from Uber or Lyft or something like that to a transit. Uh, uh, the, the, the idea there being that if someone were to develop on the periphery, they could provide an Uber to a transit uh, a transfer point or something like that. The problem is it's very likely that that becomes, well, it's gonna be easier for me to just take Uber, that Uber to work. And uh, my, my landlord's providing it. So that's great for me. So that doesn't mitigate VMT at all. So we, we took that out of the program because we didn't want to encourage that. It's certainly a, it's certainly a, a challenge. That said, there are some benefits to some of these services. Uh, you know, if it's Grubhub and someone grabs four meals at the same restaurant and takes them to different places, that's one person, one car going to all of those different places, hopefully on a trip that is optimized. So rather than having four different vehicles drive to the exact same place, potentially passing everyone's home to get there. If you're the, the, the person that lives furthest away, you get, you get one delivery driver. So um, th there's certainly a balance there. Um, you know, that we, we need to be smart about it and we don't want to, as you know, a, a government entity be supporting something that is going to encourage VMT, which, you know, providing Ubers that, that could certainly do it. You, you might see people deciding to live further away in, in an apartment building uh, because they can take their Uber to work. Um, so we don't want to encourage that. But we also don't want to discourage things that could, uh, ha you know, mitigate VMT themselves in, in, in a way that maybe is less traditional. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Karen Gunderson is asking about mileage, fuel efficiency, the other side of the, of the VMT, the flip, the other side of the coin. Uh, along with encouraging people to tra uh, travel fewer miles, shouldn't we also encourage them to downsize their vehicles or purchase more fuel efficient vehicles? Uh, can anybody comment about the, the fleet in, uh, in Madison, maybe relative to other places? What do, what do we know about that? Yes, I'm not, I'm not aware of, of our, our mix of you know, electric or alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, compared to other places, but we are incentivizing them. Um, you know, in our parking ramps, for instance, there are charging stations. Some of them are free, uh, which I think is a pretty progressive way of approaching that. It's also preferred parking. So it's not squirreled away in some corner. It's generally right up front. So if you have, uh, you know, a Leaf or a Tesla or whatever you're driving, you get a parking spot right up front. You get charging right there. Uh, the, the rates are generally lower. So it's it is a way of incentivizing and it's a start. Uh, many of these parking structures have the ability to expand uh, the, the number of charging stalls that they have in the future. So it's, it's thinking proactively about that. And, and when we're building new ramps, for instance, uh, thinking about what their life could be after they're a ramp and thinking about uh, as long as it is a ramp, as vehicles transition, are we uh, making sure that people can charge there because that's gonna be so important in the future. So Thank you. Say, yeah, from a regional perspective, that's something, you know, EVs are certainly something that we want to promote and support. And um, we're in the middle of our regional transportation plan update right now, um, which happens every five years. And um, some of the other staff that are working on the traffic modeling and, and different kind of future scenario modeling, um, the impact of EVs is one of those scenarios that they'll be looking at. Um, because you know we're right on the cusp. That's one of those kind of potential big drivers of change um, that we still have a lot to learn about to see where it goes. All right, thank you, thanks. Um, so uh, Erhard Joris uh, 
former uh, director of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at UW asks, has anyone considered a tolling system for driving on the isthmus such as exist in other cities like London, Stockholm, et cetera? What about the isthmus? Well, I can tell you that I actually just did a presentation where I talked about the fact that New York City is going to have what they call, um, now I can't remember what it's called. Congestion um, pricing. Congestion pricing, yes. It's the first place in the US that's done it. Um, super controversial, but it's pretty easy to block off and because it's only gonna be Manhattan and only lower Manhattan. It's much easier to block off a part of, a, of an island. <laughs> Um, you know, the isthmus does work, but people still get upset about paying for parking. I'm not sure we're ready for congestion pricing yet. Um, I think maybe the TDM efforts and uh, making parking more expensive. I mean, it's not a very good use for scarce urban land. That might actually be an easier um, uh, policy measure for discouraging driving into the isthmus. Just to, to build on that, that in the most recent iteration of our plan, that was one thing that we kind of zeroed in on and we doubled the points that a developer would receive for, for any sort of you know unbundling parking. Uh, so there are two benefits there. If, you, if it's an apartment building, that might mean that it's more affordable for you. If you uh, decide to rent a place and you don't need a parking stall, uh, that could be hundred bucks a month that you save on your rent. Uh, it also means practically that that person is not going to have a car that they can drive to downtown. So uh, that's, I think we need to look at alternatives that, that fit our community and that might be more palatable, you know, looking at parking, reducing parking, uh, densifying some of our urban areas by uh, shared parking arrangements and things of that nature. Uh, but that's certainly an interesting idea um, and uh, certainly an interesting idea. All right. Yeah, Thank and you. I would add that you know things things like that definitely um, drive behavior change. You know, much better than than right like information and encouragement and things like that. And that's one of the reasons that we are really excited about this potential TDM program at the city level, is to have have something in place. Like when you look around the nation and you look at cities that are doing really amazing things and regions that are doing really amazing things and they have a really low, you know, single occupancy vehicle mode share. It's when you dig into that, it's because there is a local, you know, there's a local policy or regulation or there's a statewide policy or regulation that's really driving employers and others to, you know, come to a program like ours and say, hey, how, how can we meet this? what can we do? And then, so, so, so things like this, I mean, what Philip just mentioned about, you know, we need to right size for our community at this point. Um, but those types of interventions are going to really be the most effective. So Zia, can you, uh, I, this is kind of tantalizing the amazing things that other places are doing. Can you, can you give us a couple examples? Well, I, I would love Robbie to jump in here too, because Robbie's done a ton of research on this, but I think yeah. like Seattle, I mean, is one really incredible um, place where they're doing a lot of good work. They've, you know, I can't quote numbers, but they've had huge reductions in um, just in the, the amount of drive alone to work, but then just vehicle, you know, kind of congestion, vehicle miles traveled, all that. Um, they have a statewide commute trip reduction law. Um, and then they also locally in the Seattle region have um, some really strong leadership happening. So they kind of have multiple levels of um, support there. They've integrated their pass system for their light rail and their buses and their, you know, all the modes of transportation. So you've got one pass that gets you access to everything. That's huge. You know, imagine if we had that for Metro and B cycle here and, you know, future modes that come online. I, and so Robbie, I don't know if you want to add anything else. I know. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> in writing that report, I 
researched a lot of what other cities were doing. Um, Portland's got an incredible program um, where they started by taking each neighborhood and concentrating on the neighborhood to get to teach people how to reduce their trips. And then they found it to be so successful. They still have the programs called Smart Trips, um, but they only do it for people who've moved. So if you move into Portland or even within the city, that's an inflection point where you are changing your habits because you have to find a new place to shop, a new way to get to work, a new school, a new library, a new bar, a new you know way to get to your friend's house. And so what they do is when people move, they try and use that opportunity to help people learn how to use other methods of transportation besides driving to reduce the driving in Portland. And um, a lot of what we did for Los Angeles and also a lot of the charts that Philip showed as far as the point system was based on a program in San Francisco where partly as part of their um, I mean, they have a lot of programs. A lot of those points all came from San Francisco. Um, but the link to affordable housing cannot be underestimated. People who are renting an apartment and don't own a car and are still paying for a parking spot because it's bundled in their rent, that makes their rent more expensive. And it also means that if you're building a lot of parking, that space that you can't use for other uses like apartments or offices or stores, that urban space could be used for something else. So, you know, really unbundling it and making people think about their parking costs as well is a big deal. And then also, I mean, like you were talking about Uber to the, to the, um, transit line, what they do in San Francisco is if you're an employer, you can run a shuttle to the BART station, but it's only from your, from your office to the BART station, their rapid transit. So it gets people that last mile. So a lot of it, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts basically says, we're not building any additional parking. You're, you 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 can't build any additional parking. <laughs> I'll just add one little tidbit here too today that I was something I was just putting together. So again, back to kind of the Seattle area, when you take it down to the employer level and you have employers that are motivated, um, you know, to, to promote options and, and kind of have a limit on the amount of kind of like parking and, and drive alone commuting that can be happening um, related to their work site. The Seattle Children's Hospital is like one of the shining star examples around the nation um, for the impact that they've been able to have um, on their workforce. And one of the things that they do, they have a kind of suite of tools, but one of the big things is paying people $4 a day for every day that they don't drive alone to work. And if you can imagine how that would add up for you, right, over the course of the year, um, they have an extremely low drive alone rate um, to their location. So it's like it can be done, but it's what are all the levers in place to kind of make it happen? One, one more place that I'm going to throw in because people often say, well, you know, yeah, this is great for cities, but what about, you know, more suburban areas? Pasadena, California um, decided that they were going to come up with metrics for what they had now, as far as how many people could walk to transit, uh, you know, how many people had access to, a first quality bike route, um, the density, I can't remember, there were four metrics. But basically, if you want to have a development, you can't decrease those metrics for the city. And if you do decrease them, then you have to do something like sponsor a, a um, transit, you know, stop or pay for a sidewalk so people can walk there or things like that. And it's really encouraged uh, developments, both commercial and private develop, uh, residential developments, to be more in the city. I mean, they gave the example of a hospital that wanted to build in a greenfield, and they had to, they were going to have to do all this mitigation. 
And they said, oh, well, maybe we can build over here and much more compactly, and then we don't have to do as much. So Pasadena is not, it's not a big city. It's not considered, you know, a dense urban area, really. And they also are doing TDM efforts as well. All right, thank you. Um, so we're at the hour, but we do have a little overflow time and we have lots of questions. So I hope I can prevail on panelists to hang out for a few more minutes. Um, a question, I think, to go to Philip here about um, how expensive is it to add bike paths and other safety measures, uh, you know, not coming from an employer or a developer perhaps, but from the, from the city? So it, I mean, it varies. Um, so I, I, I would be reluctant to give just a per mile uh, mm -hmm. cost, uh, but it, it, you know, it, it, is, it is expensive. Um, that said, when you look at the cost of a development in, in general, uh, we're already subsidizing other forms of transportation. So whether it's one parking stall at ten thousand dollars, or uh, you know an underground parking stall at seventy, you know these these transportation, uh, you're subsidizing all of it. So if we can get them to to not subsidize as much parking and focus on providing other other types of transportation, that's what that's 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 our goal anyway. So part of that is shifting some of that. I mean, we provide mitigation points for uh, building paths instead of, uh, instead of parking. So, I mean, that's the sort of thing that we, we are trying to encourage. All right, thanks. Uh, Janet asks a uh, related question. What is safer for an older person, an electric bike or an electric scooter? I bet that's a Robbie, isn't it? Well, it depends on what you mean by scooter. If you're talking about what are those little things that you sit on and you like, you know, they look like a one person golf cart. Uh, what are those things called? I can't remember. Um, you know, the, people you call them scooters. So it's a little confusing when you have but the like, the, the you know, you can take them in the racers. grocery store. You know what I mean? That's different. Oh, like a mobility scooter. Yeah. That's, like a mobility yeah. scooter. Okay. I wouldn't, I personally feel a lot more comfortable on a bike than I do standing up on a scooter, but that's me because I've been biking since I was four. Um, but the other thing is you can get very cool electric tricycles and you can't fall over. <laughs> and you can carry a lot, of, a lot of cargo on a tricycle as well. Well, now I think in, and in most cities aren't the electric scooters um, designated to the roadways. It depends. I was just in Tulsa and they're all over the sidewalks, all over. Okay. So it might depend on where you're allowed to yeah. ride too. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so here's a question from Kathy Kuntz. Uh, we tend to measure progress reducing emissions and transportation based on BMTs, but less traffic means less congestion which means less fuel usage, even for the same vehicle miles traveled. How are people measuring those kinds of emission reductions? I'm just gonna jump in with the words induced demand. <laughs> I, I don't think that you could just reduce VMT and, and leave the transportation network as it is. You've got to also be right-sizing the transportation network as that's occurring. So that's road diets and things of that nature. In terms of the emissions, the UW actually does a lot of work measuring emissions. Um, so there are multiple points throughout the city where emission, emissions are measured daily. So it's it's not something that it, it, that, that the city's doing, but it is something that the that the UW is doing. And I know that the MPO reports on those annually. So my my comment about induced demand is that if you widen the road or make it easier to drive, it just fills up. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much everybody in transportation field knows this, but we keep widening the roads thinking we're gonna cure congestion and just it just encourages more people to drive, which is of course more emissions. 
there's also a, a report that I think Kathy knows about, but others might not. The urban mobility report from, I believe, Texas A&M University um, that has a really cool, if you, if you search for that urban mobility report, um, they have some great kind of measures and metrics where you can look at the impact of emission or impact of reducing congestion on emission reductions. And you can actually drill down to our city, like to Madison and, and I think Dane County as well. Um, so that's worth checking out. All right, so it's definitely a thing. <laughs> um, now I've got a question from Meg Gordon who asks, feeling safe and separated from the noise and aggression of many drivers helps encourage people to walk or ride bikes to do errands. Are there plans in place to make these options more pleasant? And if not, what's the best way we can advocate for such an environment to be created and prioritized? I, I can take that one. So we, we are working on, on some, some plans. We have a green and complete streets plan that we are currently in the process of, of, of working on. So that's gonna create different roadway cross sections that prioritize different modes of transportation. So we're looking at the entire transportation network throughout the city and figuring out what modes of transportation should be prioritized and coming up with different cross sections uh, for those roads. So cross sections being everything you'd see in the right of way, sidewalks, street trees, places for parking, vehicular drive lanes. And we're acknowledging that there are places where there might be priority for multiple modes. And at the very top, of all streets is being a pedestrian. Um, because at, at some point in every trip, you're a pedestrian, whether you it's walking to your car, walking to transit, walking to your bike, or leaving any of those modes, you're, you're a pedestrian. So um, we, we, we're certainly using that as kind of a, our, our baseline. And we're thinking about that uh, as, we, as we think of these. And then when we reconstruct streets, we would be thinking about uh, those cross sections. That would be our starting point. And then we would look at the neighborhood specifically to make sure that it fits the neighborhood. And I'll just add from a regional perspective, the MPO has, um, the, the MPO's policies are really aligned to supporting multimodal transportation and the funding criteria that are in place when um, communities apply to the MPO for federal transportation dollars the criteria and how um, those proposals are evaluated uh, really emphasize multimodal transportation. Um, and additionally, the infrastructure bill that was just passed um, at the federal level includes a lot more emphasis on um, multimodal transportation and equity and safety um, and more funding for pro programs like the TAP or Transportation Alternatives Program, which is one that the MPO funnels money through. Um, and that is that program focuses on funding bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. So we're just gonna see a lot more of this um, emphasis happening from the federal government down, which is, is great. Okay, thanks. I have uh, uh, one more question here. Um, are any municipalities that you know of incentivizing purchase of EVs and hybrids by offsetting the state surcharge, perhaps by providing rebates to residents? Is that even allowed under state law? I guess I'm unaware of any municipalities in the state that are. Uh, what you do see more is electric companies subsidizing charging stations for your house. I think MGE actually provides, um, so you could, you could pick up a charging station through them and they will subsidize that to a certain extent. I'm not 100% I'm not sure of the exact amount, um, but I, even if it's spreading it out uh, and, and getting that installation covered, which I believe is what they do, they spread the cost of the, the actual charging infrastructure for your garage. Um, but I'm not, I don't know that I don't know that it uh, would be cost effective for a city and uh, I'm not sure of any that do that. Uh, statewide, some states do do that. Um, we're not one of those, unfortunately. Right. right. There are well, also around the nation some examples of electric bike rebate programs um, also through uh, groups like MG&E. Yeah. All right. 
Well, I've kept you here uh, longer, longer than advertised. I just want to thank uh, Robbie and Philip and Zia again. I want to also acknowledge that uh, Zia was instrumental in getting some of the swag that's part of our of our uh, challenge. So if you sign up for the challenge, you'll understand what I mean. Um, uh, definitely a great forum, great answers to questions, lots of, uh, lots of further questions in my mind based on your presentations. It's just a, another one of those incredibly complex subjects that comes up in everything related to climate and uh, sustainability. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to all our participants for your great questions. And uh, good night, everyone.